2016, and then in Beijing at the Theater Treffen, and also toured worldwide. And now we have Hans von Krusinger with us, who um, was part of the production and observed them here in New York, but also um, it was Hannah Muller Emberlin. So thank you. works here? Uh, yeah, we see. Hello, thanks for coming. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, it has been a long time uh, since I've been here. In, uh, well, I was uh, uh, one of the, uh, uh, the person sitting around and watching uh, during Hammer Machine when, uh, when Bob was staging this production in 1986 uh, of, of Highness. And uh, I'm a bit tired because it took us 70 hours to come to Berlin thanks to four different airlines. So we started on Saturday and uh, we arrived yesterday night, so it was a real interesting journey. And... Um, I heard a lot of stuff in the talks today, uh, which I would also have told you, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to repeat a lot of things again. <laughs> so, uh, so I try to, uh, to open up some, uh, maybe some other windows, or uh, open some windows uh, where we can have a deeper look into some of the, uh, the rooms which uh, you already uh, have been in today. And, uh, uh, well, I would like to start with. It's a beautiful sound. And this sound has a lot to do with, uh, with Hamlet Machine. And it has a lot to do with uh, what I think what was happening in Hamlet Machine uh, with Robert Wilson and with, uh, with Heine Müller. Because from, uh, from my point of view, is uh, Hamlet machine is uh, um, it's Heine's reaction to the translation he did with Hamlet. And he just uses his five monologues from Hamlet and he uses this as a basic structure for Hamlet machine. And, uh, um, but what he is adding is uh, Basically, he's dealing with Shakespeare in the first part in the family scrapbook, and in the parts after it, uh, he's opening up into the 20th century, and he's opening up into the, into the space uh, which he himself was dealing in, and uh, the contradictions he was writing in, and uh, what, he could, what he could manage to, um, to achieve in his writing. And um, I maybe I give you, um, I looked into my notes, it was a long time ago, and when you get older, you don't remember exactly what happened. Um, so when we started on the 12th of April in 1986 here in, uh, in New York at, uh, at NYU, uh, Bob uh, had every, every, Buddy who was involved in the production was sitting around at a very long table and there was a discussion going on about, uh, uh, about the text. And uh, Bob said something which was very simple and you have heard it before. The first thing we have to do is to reduce the list, the ideas of the play. Say in one sentence what the play is about, just what you think. And this is a very, uh, how you say, it's a very intelligent uh, strategy of a director to, uh, to get to know the cast and to get to know the text and to get to know the people he works with. Because uh, you force everybody to concentrate on, on one line, on one line which is important for you, 
And of course, so you immediately get an image of the people you work with. So uh, it creates a kind of, uh, uh, of intensity. And the other point, I think, which maybe is even more important, every person who says a sentence has made a decision. And uh, this theater of Heine Müller is a lot about decisions. It's a lot about decisions and uh, choices you make, choices you have, but you have to stay with one thing. And uh, this creates, of course, a lot of material. And what to me was very interesting, because I have to say how I got involved in this production, because I and Frank, uh, we were in the uh, production. Heine Müller was a visiting professor at uh, Gießen, and he staged Hamlet Machine with us. He didn't want to do this. He wanted to do, uh, how you say, he wanted to do, ha uh, I think he wanted to do Mauser with us. Uh, but we insisted on doing Hamlet Hang Machine because young aspiring artists, they all want to do Hamlet Machine. <laughs> they don't want to do Mauser. And uh, so we forced him somehow to do Hamlet Machine with us, which he did. And uh, what was interesting, our production had some similarities to the way uh, Bob was doing. There were some choices which were interesting. And uh, now coming back to this point with this uh, one line, with this one idea, what I just give you a few sentences. A person telling the story of a character he was. The roadrunner on cocaine playing Shakespeare. Sex and drugs and terror in Europe. A woman's view to male history. And as you already can see when you listen, it's opening up a whole cosmos of ideas. Because uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the Hamlet machine, but the Hamlet machine, it starts in the first part, I was Hamlet. The second part is, I am Ophelia. So you have this difference in time. There seems to be one person coming from the past or dealing with something coming from the past, and another person dealing with uh, the real situation, the present. And what is interesting to me, what when Heine was writing it, it was a time when uh, in Germany there was a big discussion about uh, the terrorism, the Red Army faction. Uh, Ulrike Meinhof was a big figure, and there are connections to, to this in, in Hamlet. And uh, just, but let's not get too much into it because uh, speakers after me, they will tell you maybe more about this. And, uh, but let us continue because what, uh, to me, was then very interesting was this process of reducing the ideas of the play. Uh, four words, three words, two words, one word. And there is a similarity between Heiner and uh, Bob. Uh, both of them are obsessed with structure. So structure of play, form, uh, structure of um, uh, how you create. And the most interesting, you have seen this uh, in another, uh, another lecture before. Uh, of course, Hamlet Machine has five parts. So you have this, of course, classical one, two, three, four, five, three is the center, one to five, two to four, and three is the scherzo. But what was interesting when uh, uh, Bob was developing the play, the first round he did was creating the picture without the text. So it was like a silent version of, uh, of a process of creating uh, an image. And, and when you look into the, um, into the, how you call it, the regie book in English, uh, the director's book, where all is, here's yeah, the production book, where everything is written down, it says um, it's 3.50 in the afternoon, 1957, a gray in the park after a picnic. A gray day. There's a stone or a metal wall upstage. In the gray sky, there's a light movement of yellow. It looks like the lights just before a tornado strikes. A table, a tree, chairs. So you don't need much for doing a hammer machine. And uh, from my point of view, this a tree, a table, three chairs. This is coming from another text of Heiner's because Bob directed just before Alcestis. 
and he used description of a picture, explosion of a memory, as a text for uh, intercutting with, uh, uh, with uh, Alcestis. And when you have a close look to the thing, description of a picture, to the text, uh, you can find elements which you will find in the staging of Hamlet machine. There are these objects which come from, from this point of view, from my point of view, uh, of course. So um, maybe let's go to, um, to another point, uh, just another point picking up from the, um, from the production process because when uh, there was a process of few days of discussing the ideas of the text, uh, getting closer to the, to the structure point of view, then developing the, the image, and uh, then, and that's the most difficult part for uh, a lot of German actors, uh, when he talks about the elements uh, which he uses for the staging. And he always says that uh, light is for me like an actor. And in this rehearsal process we had in doing Hamlet machine, uh, there was one week just for lightning. So uh, the light gets an incredible amount of time, just production time, from, uh, from the needs of an actor to prepare the show, to run the show, and, uh, and of course it creates something for the audience. But uh, let's not too much go in detail. And uh, the other strategy, what Bob has, and he does this a lot of times, is that uh, he doesn't speak too much. So everybody talks in the, um, in the rehearsal process about the play and everything, but he's silent. So when you say something, then it becomes very important because you don't waste words. And uh, what is interesting, when he was talking about the approach to language, and the approach to language, he was telling the, uh, the actors here in New York uh, about a great German actor. Uh, his name was Fritz Kortner. And um, he was talking about the way the diction, the diction when he was speaking, there is so much space in the words. When you speak as an actor, you must give the audience a chance to notice the space between the letters while you are speaking. And this has something to do with the uh, 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 ability of, of Bob and of Heiner, that both of them are very good listeners. They're very good listeners for the space between the words, for the decisions which can be made from one word to another. And that's, of course, is, uh, it's a great way of taking the audience serious. Because if you create this kind of space, if the audience if they want to listen, they can take a lot out of it. If they don't want to, they don't. But who cares? Because in the end, uh, the people in the space who are producing it listen to it much more than the audience does. The audience sees it one time. So in the, uh, in the process of developing, it has to be always interesting for the people who are involved in the process of work. And... Uh, uh, Niklas, who spoke before me, he spoke about this, uh, this term, uh, snow on her lips, auf den Lippen Schnee. And I, as I remember in the production uh, here in NYU, I think it was Lisa, she always spoke, uh, she was repeating snow on her lips. And in the 80s, when you spoke snow on her lips, everybody was speaking about cocaine. So it creates this other kind of... Uh, resonance room which is there just because of the time being when the performance is happening. And uh, it's strange when you change your concept and you uh, say, okay, you don't want to talk about this, suddenly um, you have to reorganize everything. Um, but coming back to this issue of, uh, of this um, this speaking the text and um, because it was really beautiful when the picture was developed, the first sequence, without, uh, uh, 
without the words, everybody was, was stunned in the space. And because the actors were doing it so beautiful, it was so much fun and excitement, and it was really a privilege to watch these actors working because they were really into it. And then uh, at the end of it, he said, why shouldn't they play with Heine's text? It's difficult to play with Heine's text because Heine's text is very strong. But I think that's the reason why both of them got along so well because Heine's text is so strong that you can play with it. You can break it down and you can use it to interfere, to fight with the picture. It will still stay there because it has this energy. It has this power. And from the, uh, from the aesthetics of Heine, uh, for Heine always the most important thing was the drama, writing the drama. And the drama is much stronger than the theater because in the theater is everything is happening. But the drama is a thing which stays. And uh, so he says, when he has written the text, the text is finished. The text is there. And the text is like a stone. You can throw it in the water, it will still survive because it's a strong text. And what was interesting, because uh, I have to, to dance things a little bit, because later on I was working with Heiner uh, on his Hamlet machine in East Berlin. And there was uh, talking about uh, similarities between, uh, well, Wilson staging, no, not Wilson not being, not being present, but having influence on the way uh, Hamlet machine in East Berlin was uh, staged. Uh, you could say that, but uh, you have to go then very much in detail uh, in the way you, how you mean that. Because uh, what was interesting that uh, what Heine Müller was doing when he was staging Hamlet Machine in Berlin, he was using Hamlet and Hamlet Machine. But he was using Hamlet Machine to disturb Hamlet. So in Hamlet, you had little sequences from, uh, from Hamlet Machine, and then you had a big block when Laertes is going to, uh, to England, uh, the Hamlet Machine was performed. But when we were doing it in, in 89-90, uh, the problem was that uh, the so real uprising was happening on the street, and uh, a lot of these lines from Hamlet Machine suddenly seemed to be uh, a description of what was going on in the streets outside. And uh, when the theater gets too close to the present, it becomes difficult uh, uh, to do it. And the situation in the theater was terrible because sometimes uh, performances could not happen because the, uh, the stage workers were in West Berlin, no one was there to put up the set, and. Uh, uh, actors were attacked because of the privilege they had in East Berlin. Uh, they could uh, travel, East Berliners could not travel. So it was a very difficult production time for all the people involved in the show. And when, uh, well, when Heine started uh, with the rehearsals, the GDR was still existing. And when the play opened, the GDR was gone. And it doesn't happen very often that uh, the state you're discussing dissolves during the process of rehearsing. So it becomes uh, difficult to deal with some of the sentences, with some of the lines. But uh, from my point of view, it was a very powerful performance, dealing with the situation of the theater in uh, East Berlin, West Berlin, in Germany, and also uh, dealing with, uh, with the fact that uh, how you can tell a famous old story and use it to, uh, to comment on a situation which is happening in the state. And what does this do to the literature? And, uh, but let's, let's go a step back. And uh, because when the, uh, now coming back to Hammond Machine in East Berlin, no, not East Berlin, in New York, um, there's a lot of details about what was happening on which day, but uh, maybe it's not so important right now. It's, uh, but what is interesting was uh, the soundscape, because in the soundscape, uh, what was, was happening was, in this first silent part, 
it was just the absence of speech, but it was not silent. You had music, you had these tones from this, uh, from this song, uh, Is This All There Is? Um, uh, I think it was from Hildegard Knef or what it was sung. And uh, you had wolves, you had the sound of paper tearing apart. And uh, when the text started in family scrapbook, you had only male voices. And in this soundscape, what was added was wolves. And you have the, um, it's a real beauty of the German language. There is this, okay, so <laughs> that's a good one, it's good to, good to know. Uh, there is this, um, this is very nice line. Manchmal im Winter kamen sie ins Dorf, zerfleichten einen Bauern. Sounds beautiful. Sometimes in winter, they came into the village and butchered a peasant. It's also very beautiful, but it's a total different attitude. It's a total different way of uh, communicating and relating with the audience, from my point of view. And uh, in the English version, uh, a kingdom for a killer is much stronger than ein Königreich für einen Mörder. And what Heiner is uh, in his writing, what he was obsessed with, he said it in several interviews, and I think you have to take it seriously, that uh, when he had to make a decision about um, writing, uh, which word he would use in a, in a line, he says he would always use the word which sounds best. That's a decision. Because in the theater it's about speaking the line. It's not about reading it. It's about what you listen in the moment when someone speaks it. And uh, now I think I uh, dedicate my last 30 seconds to the gods and uh, Wilson, <laughs> and uh, maybe we can discuss about it later. So thanks for listening. Um, <clears throat> so we have about five minutes, so there could be a question again. Hans, we 72 hours uh, to come here. Um, and uh, this is quite, um, quite something. And yes, we both were in Heiner Müller directing Hamlet Machine. I played Hamlet, I spoke all the text. We toured Germany, we became a little phenomena. And Bob came to see, and this is how I came to um, uh, meet Bob Wilson. He loved the show and said, I'm gonna do that too, at least that's what we think. Um, <laughs> so any, any uh, talks, uh, uh, thoughts, um, or comments on what Hans Werner just said? It's a very significant thing, and so we always should listen to artists, you know, and uh, so any, Anything comes to your mind? Or a question? You can even say things you didn't like. It's not a problem. Actually, I have a very funny, maybe trivial question. Uh, you mentioned Wilson discussing Fritz Kortner, and yeah. so I thought it was a little bit funny because Kortner had died before Wilson would have had a chance of seeing him. So no, 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 no. There are, there are a lot just of... Just recordings? Uh, there's recordings, and, but there is also filming of uh, him in several... So uh, he, he watched it, or how uh, did I you know? I think so. I think he saw yeah, it. Because I was wondering whether it was via Peter Stein or somehow that he would get to know I don't know, but I think he saw it because That's he was describing I, it I so no precise idea. that uh, he must have seen it. Yeah. And the other point, I got to know Wilson before I were in Gießen because I saw the show The Golden Windows in Munich by chance. And there he was working with, uh, with a very old German actor, Peter Lühr. And Peter Lühr is one of, was one of the biggest German actors you had. And he has also this, he was also able to do this kind of speaking, this way of dealing with texts on the stage. And, uh, well, Bob talked a lot about this experience working with this old German actor who brought so much to his play. Because what was interesting, he was doing exactly what Bob told him, but on the other hand, he was performing also his 40 years of career in the theater and all the characters he played. And so it gives another kind of weight as a strong stable to the whole thing which is happening on the stage. And by the way, some people say some of the most sublime productions ever by Robert Wilson. I wish I had seen it, World in Windows. Bob also loved Alexander Moisi, he's the uh, Italian or North Italian Trentino actor. I had to once go to archives and find him the, some recordings he couldn't hear, the Faust, the Easter walk, and all of it, which he then also used. But um, and he said, yeah, just to listen. He said Moisi could do seven versions of Hamlet with his voice. 
Yeah. So oh, anything? It's, no, it's, it was the Golden Windsor was his. I was there. I had no idea who Robert Wilson was. I went there because I've seen. I tried to see every show with his. It was in Munich with this old German actor because I really admired him and loved him because he was an unbelievable actor. And I went to and I saw, I saw Golden Windows and I had no idea when I came out of the theater what I've just seen. But it was so fascinating that the next day I was standing in front of the theater. The show was sold out and I wanted to see it again. And things like this happen in the world of theater. Uh, there came a person and gave me a ticket as a present because his wife could not come or so something. And so I had the chance to see it two times. It was unbelievable. Maybe one more, one comment. Yep. So I was struck, you just said that you had seen a production with an actor who brought all of his 40 years of history to the role, working on Hamlet Machine with students. And I know um, Wilson had worked a lot with non-actors beforehand, young students who don't have that. What was the process like? Was he demonstrating it for them and then they did, or did he just tell them to do and they did because they didn't bring all those years to the material? Uh, I think, well, well, the next uh, session we'll talk about this in detail, I think. And the other point, what you, what you should not forget is that uh, what was so fascinating about the students was that uh, um, uh, I, have, I have written it down, but I, it's too difficult to find it right now. It's, uh, Heine said in one interview when he was talking about the hammer machine in New York, he said uh, that in New York in the 80s, uh, the show was happening in the evening. And it's quite dangerous to go to the theater in New York in the evening coming with the subway or uh, so people had to be uh, really, they knew about the conflicts which were going on around them. And the students we were working with, uh, they were full personalities. They knew about the conflicts which were going on around him and around them. And the point is, when you want to do a play of Heiner Müller, uh, you have to be aware of conflicts because his theater is about conflict. And what Wilson is doing when he was staging it with, uh, with the actors, I'm sure you will listen more to this in the next uh, session, is uh, that he is creating conflicts for the actors as well. And the kind of purity and uh, devotion these students had, uh, you won't find it in a lot of, as I always think the American production was much better than the German production, much better. Because, and from another point of view, uh, Look at it. In Shakespeare, you have two female parts. In the Hammond machine, you had seven female parts and seven male parts. So just from a question of balance, what you could do. And it was very interesting how the, uh, the play was structured, with the male voices in the first part, female voices in the second part, third part as a scherzo, where you had the, uh, the film, and it was transferred into the universe, and Jesse Norman was singing about the dwarf. And in the fourth part, then there starts this dialogue between male and female voices. And uh, it was incredible what kind of, you know, what kind of attention the production created for the text of Heine. Because uh, through the repetitions and through the intensity of language and the laughter and the singers, uh, you had the chance to listen to some of these parts several times. And of course, then they connect differently to your brain and to your senses and to your emotions. And so it was really dealing very respectful from my point of view with, uh, with the play, with the text. Because everybody says that Wilson is not uh, concerned about the text. From my point of view, it's not true. And another thing which you should not forget is that uh, both of them had the same sense of humor. So uh, uh, it helps when you work together. And they like to drink together. That's true. <laughs> That's true. So um, now we come to, to a, very, a very special panel, but first of all, thank you, Hans Werner, for coming in and join and, uh, and sharing your work. Actually, two very significant works in two worlds, and they're all centered about Hamlet, the Hamlet machine here in New York, and then Heiner Müller's uh, Hamlet uh, uh, production in Berlin. When the wall came down or opened up, um, there's a documentary film about it. We showed it. Christian Rüter did it here in our film festival. It's a sensational uh, uh, a documentary, actually, if you uh, would like to see it. And Hans Werner was there, so you can always approach him for research. Now we come to something which I think is so unique. It is something where we say, what is the secret sauce? How did things get done? What happens really in a room? And um, we have with us um, uh, now N. Catanio, William Ivy Long, and Jennifer Rohn. A dramaturg, an actor, 
and a costume designer, and they will tell us things uh, we otherwise will never hear, and they would be lost. And some people say, if, even for theater productions, who remembers best, you know, the thing? It's not the director, it's not the actor, it's the technicians or people who put it together. So now we have them here, and it's a big privilege, and would like to thank and Catania for helping it together. So Anne is the dramaturg, <laughs> Jennifer the actor, and William. Thank you. Can you project this and send our pictures? I'm not sure. Um, I'm looking, I'm going to grab this. Yeah. Okay. I pull it in. Sit down, open. Oh, yeah. Second, we have to always oh. use the mic. Okay. I'm, hi, I'm, I'm Annie. This Hold it close. is Jennifer, and this is William. Um, um, my own. I wanted oh. to to ask Frank, although it's probably impossible, to actually project the show card. Hold this it was closer the, the mic. You have to really oh, sorry. This was the actual um, card that alerted audiences that this was going on. You, you can't project it anyhow. I wasn't sure. Oh. <laughs> Okay, somebody is a technical expert. Thank you. They are working on this slide. Okay. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. Um, I want to keep track of what time it is. So, uh, it's, it's always frightening when you have to sit in front of your picture. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so I'm trying to get the actual show card, which really tells who was doing what. Um, this panel really should be called The Room Where It Happened, because this is about the room where it happened. Um, and I'm going, I, I wrote all these notes out this morning. I've also been in touch with the sound designer, Scott, who's up in, in uh, Maine right now. Jennifer, of course, was, the, I won't say the leading actress, but certainly an important actress, and William did all the clothes for the show. Um, so I'm gonna read how this crazy show came into being, which absolutely, st st the stunning fact is that when you see the anarchy of this, which perhaps represents most of what we've done in our careers, um, this is probably the most performed play of Robert Wilson, I mean, of that Robert Wilson did, this version, which who would have guessed when we did it back in, in the years? So I'm gonna just read fast, and um, William has some, images to show, so I don't know, Frank, how we do that, his drawings. Okay, very, uh, that's a gold-fashioned technique. And uh, J Jennifer has other, other things as well. Okay, uh, I, I wanna start by just quickly thanking Frank for this enormous amount of organization and activity. You cannot believe how much work this was to assemble this to a, such a worthy artist. So you're, you're gonna have to go on a vacation for a month when this is over. <laughs> Um, so with me are Hamilton Machine's costume designer and my great friend, William Ivy Long. Um, early in his career, at the time of the premiere of Hamlet Machine, he, um, that's how long we've known each other. We went to school together. He is a legend, designing costumes for classical plays, endless Broadway shows. You can look at his bio online. Um, and next to me is the woman at the table, Jennifer Roan, back then a graduate of NYU, who will tell you how after Heinrich, Heinrich Hamlet Machine, she went with the production to Hamburg and then on tour, and afterward she remained in Europe to work with Wilson for several years. She was his favorite, I think I can say that. And then she returned to the States where I had the pleasure of working with her on a project I was putting together for the acting company, called Love's Fire, contemporary playwrights, John Guare, Tony Kushner, Wendy Wasserstein, and Tazaki Shangi, Eric Bogosian, Adam Gettle, and Bill Finn, writing music and short plays inspired by Shakespeare's sonnets that I had chosen. Toured the US for a year, went to the Barbican in London, and finally came into the public for a nice run. Jennifer now teaches at Bennington. Not joining us here at Siegel, but in touch this week, Oh, that's so great, thank you. Uh, our Ham Machine's sound designer, Scott Lehrer, he's in Maine today, and I hope he's watching. 
Um, he's in Maine for the summer while we are here in broiling New York City. And his main neighbor um, is, uh, is Hamlet Machine's lighting designer, Jennifer Tipton. So they're all up there together. This is a life in the theater. Decades pass and our bonds never break. Um, you can see from the show card, which is now behind us, that that's who was in the room. The only one I don't recall was the scenery supervisor, who was probably in the shop the whole time. <laughs> Maybe some of you knew her. Um, and Christine Drummond, Bob's longtime assistant and exterior brain, that was how I, I saw her, was there as well. And also two NYU student assistant directors, Kristen Martin and Tim Maynard, who went on to found the HERE Arts Center shortly thereafter, and Bob, that was it. The duo who provided the music for, for Hamlet Machine were, by a mile, the most famous names on the show. Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller were legendary songwriters, along with Carol King, um, of the Brill Building. It's still up there on Broadway and 47th Street behind the Golden Doors. You can go up and take a look at it. You could put a whole hit single together there just by going up and down the elevators. Backup singers on four, arrangers on three, record company producers on eight, and sidemen on six. Lieber and Stoller's enormous legacy includes The Chapel of Love, recorded by the Dixie Cups, Charlie Brown and Yakety Yak by the Coasters, Hound Dog and Jailhouse Rock, by Elvis, recorded by Elvis Presley, Love Potion Number no. 9 by the, Cl by the Clovers, There Goes My Baby, and On Broadway by the Drifters. There's a great song for the ages. Spanish Harlem by Benny King, another classic, and his great Stand By Me. Lieber and Stoller were American rock and roll before the Beatles. So how did, how did this interesting mix of people come to be working on a play by an East German writer directed by the great Robert Wilson in the high-rise classroom building of, of the NYU undergrad <laughs> drama department? This was not a theater. There was no box office on the street. There was no lobby. And because of security for the students, you had to show an ID to enter and then find your way up to the small third floor, I think it was third floor th theater, among the dozens of classrooms and rehearsal spaces. The answer, the common thread, the man who pulled all this together, was producer John Wolp, W-U-L-P now deceased, and I'm sure he's looking down on us. But then a relatively highbrow Broadway producer who had brought the work of artist, author, Edwin Gorey to Broadway, who had produced John Guare's plays there and had been hired to run the Playwrights Horizon studio for NYU's undergraduate drama department. For those of you listening, especially listening from afar, it's very hard to describe NYU's undergraduate theater department, but a quick way to begin is to describe its absolutely enormous size, something in the range of 900 undergraduate acting majors, as well as very distinguished smaller graduate programs in acting, design, and directing. It was a city with a huge adjunct faculty and only something like three full-time faculty lines. You can imagine the tuition money which was always rumored to be siphoned off to the medical school. <laughs> <laughs> the students took their acting, uh, their academic classes either in seminar rooms in the library, Bob's library, or in the building where, he when, where Hamilton Machine was produced, 721 Broadway, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So they took their academic classes two days a week, and on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, they were farmed out and took their acting classes at a series of professional studios around town. Stella Adler, the Atlantic Theater Company, that was David Mamet's home, the Experimental Theater Wing, Playwrights Horizons, et cetera. So they, each, they went to different studios with the very different aesthetics, and then they came back and did their academic requirements um, on campus close by. Um, the department chair, Evangeline Morphos back then, had hired John Wolp to produce plays in the 721 building for the students to be in. And Hamlet Machine was one of them. John was what you might call an artistic Broadway producer. This is a certain type some of us know very well. 
who sometimes does things without permission and then afterwards asks for forgiveness. <laughs> that year, um, 1986, he had the great idea to produce plays from the repertory of the group theater of the 1930s, one of the United States' most important modern theaters whose members included Ilya Kazan, Harold Klerman, Clifford Odette, Stella Adler, and so many others. So we worked on Golden Boy, Semmelweis, which is about the great doctor who conquered childbed fever at the turn of the last century, and Waiting for Lefty. Um, John also organized a production of Rogers and Hammerstein's South Pacific with an absolutely fabulous, totally hip, new musical arrangement by Jeff Halpern, and set, it was set in a post-World War II care facility for shell-shocked World War II veterans who were forced to perform South Pacific over and over to relearn, relearn racist American values. <laughs> Director was Ann Bogart. John had carefully forgotten to get the rights to change this um, classic musical from the Rodgers and Hammerstein estate, who, when they found out, kindly allowed it to play for two weeks before shutting it down forever. <laughs> and then the biggest catch of all, Robert Wilson and this merry band of collaborators we are talking about today. What a season. This is why you hired John Wolfe. Uh, uh, Hamlet Machine rehearsed for three weeks on, a seven, on the 75 person stage it performed on up in the 721 Broadway building in 1986. It teched there for an additional week and was, and was to play only for invited guests in May. This didn't stop John for a second, and the sitting in the first preview, was the very first preview, was John Rockwell of the New York Times, whose rave review re ran the following day. So it ended up playing an awful lot longer, and it was the hottest ticket downtown of the year. Um, that move is familiar to us from other, <laughs> other experiences we've had. Scott Lehrer, William, and I came aboard on the first day of rehearsal, Monday, I believe. Bob had spent the previous weekend auditioning NYU student actors and had asked John additionally to bring in a few recent grads when he didn't see exactly what he wanted. Jennifer was among those. There had been an interaction probably earlier that week between Bob, Wolpe, and Lieber and Stoller, which resulted in their giving permission to use a single song of theirs in our production. Is That All There Is, by, recorded by Peggy Lee. We did not see them during the rehearsals, but we met them at the opening. Nice guys. And last night over dinner, <laughs> there was a Broadway show of their songs. They're so famous. And William told me he did the clothes for the Broadway show. <laughs> Smoky Joe's Cafe. Um, William and Jennifer will describe where they were in, the early in their early careers at the time that they did ha ha Hamlet Machine. And Scott, who at now has a huge sound facility on the Lower East Side and countless credits, emailed me this week when I asked him. And he said, quote, I was writing music back then for downtown dance companies. I was te teaching sound at NYU's Playwrights Horizon Studio, which John Wolpe ran and doing shows occasionally for Manhattan Theater Club. My company did sound for, co for corporate meetings, Fashion Week, and Central Park Summer Stage. And in a recording session studio in Chelsea, I worked with amazing musicians such as Brazilian, uh, the Bra Brazilian artist Nana Vasconcelos and Mer with Meredith Monk. So th that's who was in the room when it happened. So we began sitting on the stage in the empty, tiny theater, everyone around a very long table, and the cast, without role assignments, read the play aloud, very slowly, line by line. Bob sat at the table drawing on eight by 11 sheets of paper, endlessly drawing, and he would, from time to time, say things like, give me three associations to this line, which Anne Christine would note down. Now give me two associations, now give me one. There were many associations g given by the actors to the Hamlet references. The cast had no response, uh, no knowledge of the, any of the East German political references. And this continued, uh, I recall, for three days. 
Bob drew and drew and drew. Although I had, in fact, quite a bit of familiarity with the references in the German text, I spoke German, and I had actually met Heiner Mueller in New York when he requested a meeting and asked for a production at the Phoenix Theater where I had been working. Uh, and I was pretty close friends with Jürgen Flimm, who, the artistic director who had commissioned the work and would produce this play in Hamburg. I chose not to speak. I only watched. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that I was the only one at the table with any knowledge of East German politics. <laughs> Although I didn't even remember Hans von der being there, so he would know more than me. But I had been a huge Wilson fan since... Um, I think the first show I saw was Letter to Queen Victoria. I'd seen almost all his work, and in my first post-college teaching job, you know, you get out of school and you're broke and you have nothing, no idea what to do, so you get a teaching job at some half-assed college just to pay a little of the rent. Um, I had sent my acting students to work with Wilson in The Dollar Value of Man, presented in the rehearsal studios at BAM, an amazing take on the Scottish play where the cast carried real, beautifully scented, large fir tree branches and twirled for three hours. Burnham Wood had come to Dunsinane. But for a dramaturg, you need to understand um, and to see what interests the director and more importantly, how she, he works in rehearsal. I didn't know how the cake was baked and I would never interrupt an artist's process before understanding it. So that's why I was there. I had hoped this would be the first of many collaborations with him, and so I chose to watch and not to speak. After three days of free association, Wilson asked for the tables to be removed, and we moved into the audience. We, the, the non-actors, moved into the audience um, and were seated at tech tables. He gave me a nice drawing. Um, it's reproduced in my book, The Art of Dramaturgy, which is in many libraries. I'm not pitching it, but anyway, I, I have a whole chapter on this process. Um, and uh, we ate lunch together from time to time, Bob and I. Um, I asked him why way back when he was working out of the Bird Hoffman's office on Spring Street, he had not worked with the amazing cohort of rising New York stage actors who were hungry for work, Raul Julia, Al Pacino, Kevin Spacey, my assistant at the Phoenix, for God's sake, had cast Kevin Spacey in a non-paid, very low-budget showcase of a Schiller play, mm -hmm. and he accepted. So th these actors back then who were brilliant were hungry and looking for work. But Bob told me that he didn't know them and he had no way of interacting with them. This could have, easi this could have been easily done, but his actors were Chris Knowles, whose father designed the Harvey Theater at BAM, it's so ironic, and a puzzle of trust fund kids with lots of time on their hands. So clearly, he was the driving force. Okay. Uh, after Hunter Miller, after Hamlet Machine, they have the same initials, after Hamlet Machine's first three days at the tech table, he asked for a very long table to appear on the stage, and then three chairs, which eventually grew to be the tall laddered chairs, Reproductions were later on sale, and they can be found even now on his website. Um, th they're very resonant-looking chairs. And he sat next, Bob sat next to Anne Christine and Jennifer Tipton in the first row, and they worked privately. The two student ADs sat next to them and cued lines um, when they were finally uh, uh, brought in with a wooden clave. There was no stage manager. The rest of us were in the house. Everybody I knew pestered me to come in and watch, and Bob said he didn't really care. So often in the back of the row, there were curious artist friends, and he never noticed them. The young cast was quivering with expectation and worked incredibly hard to follow directions such as enter walking slowly, sit on chair at table, twirl, and then raise your arm and a count of 60. It would take an Olympic athlete to do this, and yet they did it flawlessly each time. This was obviously a non-equity show, so there were no breaks, and he rehearsed for hours and hours in darkness and relative silence, watching and watching. Time disappeared. And every tiny change was a revelation. I remember thinking, I wish all rehearsals could be like this. 
When we would finally go out into the street to get lunch, the world seemed garish and horribly sped up. And inside the theater, it was like a church and like a revelation. And then he had an idea, his great idea. He suddenly, without warning, jumped up, and I don't remember when this was, maybe after a week of rehearsal or something, and said, let's rotate the set 45 degrees so the audience sees it from off stage right. And this was done, and the movements were repeated exactly as they were in the first part, as each actor entered. And when the final two actors entered, Leif Tilden as a Cupid balancing on one foot and a strange chimney sweep-like character with a top hat and a dirty face, Mary Poppins, blackface, the lights went out. All this in silence, no text. And so it began, since we saw the same action from backstage, as it were, and then since the cast was so totally exhausted, he filmed them, finally, and the, for the third rotation, the film was projected, and the company lay in the, <laughs> in the offstage right, offstage space, and finally rested. Music was played there, too. Finally, they, t at the end, they reappeared for the last act and screamed. He was very into screaming. By this point, two weeks were coming to a close, and by far the strangest thing happened. When the, with the stage action complete, and after kindly extending an invitation to the company to come to his loft on the river by Canal Street for a party on the Sunday before the author was to appear, he said to the cast, quote, okay, now let's put on the text. I had never heard that sentence before. <laughs> And I have never heard it since. And the lines in the play, short play were assigned and spoken. And as the rehearsal proceeded, every tiny bit of magic was sucked out of the room. It was like we had been punched in the gut. Oh well, he said, we broke. On Monday, there was a, there, uh, after the party at Bob's, Heiner Mueller and the dramaturg from the, the Hamburg Schauspielhaus Wolfgang Wiens appeared and were very angry at Bob because the cast did not know the facts of East German politics at the time. They lectured the cast for two days and the info went right over everyone's heads. <laughs> Nothing changed. No one had any idea who Ernst Honegger was and the play was already blocked and the movements and the words set. I went out a few times after rehearsals with the trio and as I said in my book, they drank me under the table. There was a nice opening night reception. I met Lieber and Stoller, and that was it. I went back to Chekhov. <laughs> <laughs> to, end, uh, to end, I must note that Bob and I remain in touch from time to time, and when he established Watermill, he was endlessly generous to my Lincoln Center Theater Director's Lab coming in to speak to the 75 plus US and international directors about his work and reserving a space each year for a lab director to have a residency at Watermill. And that continued for almost 20 years. So we remained in touch, but he had taken a plane to Europe and we rarely saw him after that, only his productions and in the director's lab. So that's my, my, that's my recollection in the room where it happened. <laughs> Why don't I just set, set it up and she'll mic. take it. Okay. I'm going to set up the, no, I've, I just drew pictures. Um, that's what I do. I think when you're told about characters and you're given descriptive terms like Paul, English dress with top hat, then you draw it. <laughs> then here's, here's a, Oh my goodness, in go leaf in gold clothed or painted. So I, I do these, and I did this for all the, the, oh, this is particularly good, Brad in a t-shirt, like a student. <laughs> you see him in that famous picture, he's on, he's, his back is right here. This is Brad, okay? Well, this isn't Brad, but. And so I drew a picture of, of Brad, and here's the Polaroid. Do you see the little Polaroid? This is good. I'm not going to go on in all these, but y you'll see why I'm doing this one. So we get a note. Kristen Marting, who uh, was also my student. Oh, by the way, John Wolpe, the crazy, insane, mad genius John Wolpe, 
uh, f forced me to set up a play, uh, design program at the Tisch School of the Arts Playwrights Horizon School, and I taught it for, nine, for eight years. And they're still doing basically the, the framework that I set up, which basically I stole from Ming Cho Lee at the Yale Drama <laughs> School. So nothing's, nothing's really uh, ever new. So Brad, we were all, Kristen Martin, Martin typed up all these notes. I'm only going to read two of them, and then I'm going to let her tell you how she interpreted them. But so this says from Kristen, Brad has to bang his head on the picnic table throughout the piece, and now he has hurt himself too much to keep doing this. So Bob changed the movement to his elbows, and now we need some kind of pads for his elbows instead of his head. So we get these notes every day. Okay. I, th I think Brad had a, had a kind of permanent bruise. For, forever. Okay, I'm going to. Well, not permanent. I'm going to go for you. Oh, for here's one. A long time. So one of the students that was hired walked in and looked, was wearing this. And it says, for rehearsal, Tom will be wearing a black leather jacket and a black T-shirt. Brad is in a white T-shirt, possibly torn, and his black shoes that look sort of like boots. OK, then I'm going to do one more. <laughs> I could go on. But it's uh, counterproductive. OK, oh, I can't read these. But I will read this. Here we go. I'm going to get to you in two pieces. So I did this picture. It's sort of sort of a cocoon, looks like a cocoon. Then I did a diagram of what it, how you'd make the cocoon on the back. I, have, I keep everything. Virgo, careful with us. We keep everything. So this is uh, Allison. I'm just going to read this, and then I'm going to read yours, and then you take it over, because otherwise I would just laugh. Costumes. Allison. His hair is wild and in her face. Costumes. Women become very hairy through the course of the piece, like apes. No more detail yet. Thank you, Kristen. <laughs> Part five, Allison is very old with gray, massive hair. Then it says, Allison in torn, ancient dress with layers that come off, hair on her arms. No makeup, pretty much just enough for the stage. And here we go, Allison, she's Mother Earth and the sky. And Oph she is Anne Ophelia as history, old woman who is a ghost. Well, these are, f who doesn't want to try to turn those words into a piece of clothing? <laughs> those are gorgeous poetry. So, and I would get these notes. <laughs> here come you. <laughs> Here she is, and here are the references in the back. See Princess Diana and then an ad for a vermouth. Anyway, this is Jennifer. Jennifer is one half bride and one half Arabic terrorist woman, veiled Arabic terrorist woman. And then the second note from uh, the <laughs> wonderful uh, stage, they weren't stage managers, but they were... Assistant directors. There you go. Thank you. It says, Jennifer Roan, uh, Wilson said could be dressed on her right side as a bride and on her left as a terrorist. <laughs> then, it's, then it calls you Jenny. Jenny Roan is a terrorist. In first part, half of her is in a wedding garb. I'm going to leave it to you now. There you go. <laughs> what did you end up wearing? What, uh, I think I end up wearing what I wore to rehearsal. Um, black leggings and a white t-shirt, but I did have this, on the, I think about that braid down the back, mm -hmm. and I had that extension to my braid. It was like a, it was wrapped in black cloth. Do you remember that? Yeah. yeah, that was pretty strong. Uh, Wait, and and just, just before you take it over, because you were in it for two and a half years. Oh, I years. can come back, but I wanted to set her up, because she's the authentic. She, she's, she's the longest serving. <laughs> but, she is. Um, uh, I think, in a way, the greatest contribution to, to Hamill Machine, in, way, in a way, was Williams, because um, he didn't design the show. When Bob's, Bob had said at one point to him, well, what are they wearing? You know, it's like, what are they wearing? So, so he drew um, a, a sort of, and you'll see how beautifully it's drawn, uh, and you, because you've got Jennifer here as a model, an approximation that was very clearly the, the cast members. And then he gave those to the cast members. 
and they created their own costumes. They found things that they were comfortable wearing. And it's, and I don't think it's, it's a, it's a, um, an odd thing that this play has been produced m more than any other Robert Wilson play because that notion that the actors themselves are creating the reality, uh, how, the, how they want to appear, what their image is, how it fits in, that has been changed in all of the productions as the years go by, and that's why it's continually done. And when you see pictures of productions of, of Hamlet Machine, it's like, wow, they look like they're, it's, it's 2020, you know, but it was really 40 years ago. But it doesn't have a dated feeling because the actors themselves bring parts of themselves and how they see themselves onto the stage with their clothes. And I think that was a brilliant idea. Because but I think I had to go through the steps of interpreting all these notes, <laughs> which include things like Allison, he was fixated on Allison, who wouldn't be? Old lady, she tears out the clock from her heart. She is, a, she is Ophelia, she is Electra. <laughs> so this is pretty darn good, potent stuff. I'm going to read in a bridal gown. This is you again, Jennifer. Yeah. Arabic uh, underneath. A lovely Ophelia. So Jennifer knew, knew him the longest, and I think of her as his muse. Uh, so why don't you tell us how you got involved and then what happened when you went to Europe and then what happened after oh it closed? Okay, I'm, gonna be, I'm not going to take that much time. Um, but yes, uh, so Hamlet Machine was the first of four productions that I ended up doing with Bob. Um, I, I think about um, what you said about the, about, <laughs> about the terrorist. <laughs> And in, in preparing and thinking about uh, that time and where I was in my life, um, I had been training at the Experimental Theater Wing. It was an extraordinary time there. We, Anne Bogart was my acting teacher. Um, you know, uh, it, it was quite rigorous training. Um, so I was in the right frame of mind for this work, but also I had forgotten that I had just gotten back from working with Grotowski at Irvine. And so I had spent weeks working at night in silence, bloody feet, you know, <laughs> like uh, just um, what I ended up calling spiritual boot camp for myself as a young actor. I was questioning everything about um, what is theater and and I was thinking about the holy theater, even though Grotowski wasn't discussing holy theater anymore. Absolutely, you were being asked to give yourself uh, as an actor in your entirety, as he, Grotowski used to say, as a gift, you know. Um, and so I was really, it was a very confrontational time for me personally, thinking about being an actor and an artist. Um, and what I wanted to do, and out, you know, it seemed like out of nowhere this opportunity to audition for Hamlet Machine arose. I was familiar with Heiner Mueller's work. I had worked on ha a, med a Medea material at, at uh, ETW, uh, a student production. Um, uh, I remember the audition perfectly. I remember that I was uh, asked to walk on a count to a chair to turn on account to the audience and to sit on account. And that really was the audition. <laughs> but I know that what Bob wanted to know was could I fill a physical form somehow? You know, did I, could I inhabit and make a physical form interesting, I think? So, uh, what do I remember? I mean, remember being terrified. I remember being so exhausted that I lost friendships or that they were really in danger. <laughs> um, I remember that we did not know what was going on. I, I remember that we were, we did have table work, you know? We had table work. We discussed the play. We, um, we, we did discuss the play. Uh, we were listened to, 
and our, our ideas were taken in. And then came the day that we stopped talking. Um, and we sat in a, lo a row on the floor. I remember that was the first thing I think we had to do, facing the stage. And, um, and then we were called up one by one to enter the stage. Um, I remember that, and I will never forget, obviously, and my body will never forget that I was the first person on the stage, which meant, and I stood the whole time, which meant for hours and hours and hours and hours as this extraordinary piece of theater was constructed, I stood, I stood. Um, I think that, um, I remember that the text changed everything, and I have found myself listening to people talking about a text and Wilson and what an actor does and doesn't do. Um, I, I wanted to just read, just very briefly, some of the lines that I ended up saying. This is Electra speaking in the heart of darkness under the sun of torture to the capitals of the world in the name of the victims. I eject all the sperm I have received. I turn the milk of my breasts into lethal poison. I take back the world I gave birth to. I choke between my thighs the world I gave birth to. I bury it in my womb. Down with the happiness of submission, long live hate and contempt, rebellion and death. When she walks through your bedrooms carrying butcher knives, you'll know the truth. So I, See why? <laughs> I had to say those lines, right? So for me, when the text was, what did you call it? Put on. Put on. I, I, there was no, there was no, no one said to us as young actors, hey, you know all that training you've been doing for the last three, four years? This is how you apply it to this work. No one said a thing. No one said a thing. We had to figure it out ourselves, and I think, in retrospect, it was a great gift. Um, but I also think that no actor alive could say those words and not feel them. <laughs> no. No, maybe, no, no, I could a human being. So I don't know if it's a dirty secret, but I felt it. I just didn't express it. I didn't have to do anything else with it. I, I made room for it. And, and, as I, and as I worked with Ophelia in Heiner's text, the rage <laughs> of women, <laughs> you know, I think on some level, and I never said a word, I never, I would, it would feel wrong to talk to Pop about this. I didn't say a thing, but I felt the rage of Ophelia as representative of the rage of women. And I think you said something um, beautiful about, uh, about um, women's view of male history. Yeah, it's that someone said that during the, the text analysis. Yeah, so, and I would just say for the, yeah, what does that say? Under all, all the, the women, women, the sense of the terrorist. These are all quotes from Bob. Wow, yeah. Th what I want to say is all of this kind of absolute magic of creation was happening in that room. A lot of it was not discussed. But we knew, and it sounds so corny, and I, I'm a little embarrassed to say it, but I have to say it, we knew history was being made with that production. There was just no way that that level of focus and um, it just felt like crackling inspiration in the room. Um, and yeah, we were young. But, but I, I, but, but I, <laughs> we were I, so young. I, I do vividly remember that feeling and I, I, I miss it and I never had it again, um, even though I did some wonderful shows, that the hours and hours that were spent just watching Looking, looking, I mean, hours and hours, as was the case with many of his productions back then, they would go on for days, 
my old boss, Bernard Gersten at Lincoln Center Theater, who founded the public theater with Joe Papp, and he founded Zoetrope with Francis Coppola, and then he restarted Lincoln Center. You, and I, would, I said this to him, we, were, we had seen Bob's work from the very beginning. It just goes on forever, and we, you, know, you, would, you could do it for s four hours, and then you couldn't take it, and you'd go out in the lobby, and there would be people, and you'd talk, and then you'd come back for another couple of hours. And he said, Annie, it's, just, it's, it's, like, a, it's like sitting Shiva. You go in, you, 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 in, you encounter all of your friends, and you mourn, and you you are unified, and then you go out and you have a conversation. <laughs> I'm a Methodist, so I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So tell us what happened when you went to Europe. Oh wow. Um, uh, every city was different. Uh, we in Paris, someone stood up and screamed, "This is shit," and I have to let you know it. And he stormed out. Um, in French or in English? In French. <laughs> Tra someone translated for us. <laughs> in Palermo, a lot of us got, the, the play being that still. Wait, a lot of you got it, what? Uh, paranoid. Uh -huh. We had a rough time in Palermo. Our stage truck was robbed and the vibe was weird. But I would say, I would say that because it was hard, it could be hard work to sit through that play as an audience member. Some people were quite confronted by the experience. Um, some people could go on the journey and just let themselves be present from moment to moment, and it made my feeling was it made some people angry. Um, but it, oh, we had a really good time. We got to go to great places. And we were very tired. And, and, and then what happened after it closed? They, everyone else went home to America. Well, yeah. Um, so a lot of us went on to do Salome at La Scala uh, with Bob right after that. Um, uh, I then did quartet at ART and at some point Civil Wars at uh, BAM. Um, yeah. Oh, well, I could write a book about... Salome La Scala. Someone should write a book about Salome La Scala. Yeah, maybe. That was a wild ride. Somebody in the audience can interview Jennifer about the book. Oh, no. Well, you know, all of the Hamlet Machine original people, we just, most of us got together on a Zoom call for the first time. Oh. <laughs> Very recently. I wish they could all be here. It was uh, kind of amazing to see them all and to talk. And we just started talking about memories and it, just it didn't stop. Yeah, I hope I hope you can send this link to them. Yes, no, I will. I I I invited several of them. But people There's are a busy. Facebook group. There is a Facebook group. Salome at La Scala. I was brought in for <gasps> part of that. You were. And it was about. I was brought in for a moment of that or two, and it was about sleeves. <laughs> that's all I can really remember. Sleeves, sets of sleeves, and they were red. Yeah, that's because Gianni Versace did the costumes. And I was brought in secretly, <laughs> to, secretly. to make them fit. <laughs> <laughs> because we were not supermodels, and it was a great disappointment. But, um. I, never, I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> and I shouldn't say it again oh. on this mic. <laughs> I was just wondering, I just, yeah. I, I, um, if I had written anything else, just accept how uh, grateful, you know, really grateful I, I am to Bob. Yes, and, and just to conclude, um, I hope this hasn't been too irre irre irreverent, but, you know, we're working theater people. We've done it all. You know, this was really a very unique I experience, and one, you know, in terms of, like, my own experience with Bob, it lasted a long time. He was so nice to us, and... and I knew him really well for many years after that. But it's, um, you know, I, 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 I'm really grateful to Frank for doing this because when you look around at the world that we started in the theater, um, I mean, I, I, knew Wil I knew William as a really great Shakespearean costume designer. Um, I worked at so many different theaters that had so many different mandates. I did classics, I did new plays. I did experimental work, I did some teaching, uh, but the whole downtown scene, oh, 
this, I don't think it's working. Can I have to turn it on? No, this, is, okay. this is working. This is working? Okay, yeah. The, 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 whole, the whole theater community, um, uptown and downtown, was very united. And, and I guess, you know, uh, maybe I just I needed to get paid something, but I was doing a lot of stuff uptown, but I was also doing things downtown. That world has just vanished. I mean, Richard Foreman, Meredith Monk, the Worcester Group, BAM, the Lincoln Center Festival, Marty Siegel's Festival, which, which is, was later replaced by the Lincoln Center Festival, um, Ping Chong, Richard Foreman. I mean, we saw everything that they did. Pina Bausch, when she came over, I did her first interview for The Voice. Um, and, and that just seems like from a, a different age. And I think it was such an, even though we were, <laughs> like Lieber and Stoll, to some degree the uptown people, we were one. We, we all had seen everything. We, we, we knew things. I think Bonnie Maranka is talking, and she was married at the time, and her husband, as, sort of as a favor, did a small part for Richard Foreman in Rhoda and Potato Land, and she thought, okay, so I'm gonna have to make, eat dinner by myself for three weeks. She had to eat dinner by herself for three months because they kept extending the show. But it was very much a, a unified world. Can you also include Charles Ludlam and, and Tom Charles Ayan? Charles Ludlam, yes, yes, yes. yes. And only Charles Bush is, is continuing with that. Yes, yes. Wasn't it also the time of the AIDS crisis? Was that somehow present in a way? Well, yeah. My, <laughs> my brother actually, I just realized the timing of all of this. My brother had AIDS and was diagnosed during that time. And so he died right before we went on tour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had an assistant who yeah. died of AIDS. I mean, I mean it, was every, everywhere. it was everywhere. And, and no one knew what it was for such a long time. Uh, I mean, it's weird, you know, AIDS, COVID, it's like, wh what all are we living through? But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there were a lot of very, very um, really good plays about AIDS that used that as a subject matter. But it was definitely, you know, a, a vibe in the world that we were living in. The world's, uh, world's collapsing in on different levels of the... Yeah, it was collapsing, but it was also just such a fertile... I mean, we're not talking even about... I haven't mentioned playwrights. My world has been largely connected with playwrights, but Lanford Wilson, Circle Rep, you know, David Mamet, uh, the public theater. When I was at the Phoenix, um, we did world premieres of... So first-time productions of plays from all over the world. We did... Uh, you know, plays that were very popular that ended up being, you never knew what these things, plays that were very popular by, we did um, uh, Wendy Wasserstein's first play, I commissioned Chris Strang's Beyond Therapy, we did Robert David McDonald, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the, his play on Diaghilev, which came in from Scotland, we did Boto Schlaus's The Big and Little, we did Mustafa Matura's Meetings from Trinidad, David Hare, I mean, we, we did so, such an interesting variety of things. And all that has sort of fallen away, especially the, the European, I mean, the, the, the non-American work it fell away. And, and let me just say, right before uh, Hamlet Machine, I did Hamlet, I designed costumes for Hamlet, uh, directed low. by Liviu Chule at the Public Theater starring Kevin Klein, with Harriet Harris as Ophelia. And and like that, and and and, and, and Gertrude was the great. Yes, uh, uh, I want to yes. say Priscilla Lopez, but it wasn't Priscilla Lopez. No, but then I would be in the room cutting hair because this was the time when everyone had big big hair, men and women, every just hair, hair, hair. Well, uh, the, as the notes, everyone's hairy, lots of hair, and uh, oh, and then there was hair, but that was earlier. Um, and I was cutting Kevin Klein's hair, and I became invisible. I cut lots of hair on Broadway at that time, and Kev and uh, uh, Joe Papp walks into the room. Now this is how personal it was back then. Pa uh, Joe Papp and Kevin were very, sort of father-son relationship, very d uh, important relationship we knew, and we've of course read about it since. And he's, uh, Papp stood at the head, top of the stairs, this was a below ground <laughs> dressing room, and he said, Kevin, tonight, tonight are you going to be Kevin Klein, or are you going to be Hamlet? <laughs> and he said, 
I'm going to be Hamlet, Joe. So there was stuff going on. <laughs> yeah, maybe we go to some audience question. We have 10 more minutes. Are there comments or thoughts or? Um, yeah. Um, uh, uh, questions, especially to Jennifer, because I'm very curious about, especially your experience after ha uh, having the experience with Grotowski and then working with Robert Wilson. And I I'm curious about after that, looking back, how would you compare or synthesize these two experiences? Uh, how would you compare the exhaustions or confusions between these two experiences? And what, 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 what did you discover through that also? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, well, you know, I think of Krotowski as, as um, I, I teach him, I use the, the way of thinking about acting, and um, it's very much a, p a part of who I, who I am as a teacher and an actor. Um, I would say that um, a sense of, of, uh, of rigor about my work um, was absolutely, I was, I was prepared for the rigor of Hamlet Machine because I had worked um, with Grotowski. Um, what I would say post working with Bob uh, was that um, I, I, I missed working um, from impulse. <laughs> um, I really missed plays um, at that time, but what I, div I, I did a play, the first play I did after having worked with Bob for a long time was um, a play called The Sleepless City at La Mama, and I had, I had kind of a, 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 a Nina moment. I, I realized I had forgotten how to, I had forgotten how to act. <laughs> You know, I had forgotten how to relate to another person on stage, because Bob often had, I, I was often by myself. Um, and so, um, you know, I needed, I needed to balance, some balance for, as myself, for myself as a performer. But that, uh, Bob treated me, in retrospect I realized he really treated me um, like an artist. And, uh, and I knew that when I was working with him, I was part of creating art. Um, and I've carried that with me. I teach that to my students. Um, I try to give them agency as actors to think about themselves as artists, to have a practice, to, um, to really feel that, that there's a lot that they can control. Uh, I don't know if I answered your question at all. Um, Except I continue to question why I act and <laughs> why I teach theater, and and I <coughs> both Bob and Grotowski are big touchstones for me. I go back to to the work and to the thinking about theater all the time. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Another thought or question or. I just want to thank you for sharing your experiences. And I think one of the things that I'm taking away from Nicholas's conversation forward to your conversation is just how important attention is. And, and what Wilson gives us is the need for attention. And, and within all of our roles, like as a drop, I'm a dramaturg too, it's, it's being attentive and figuring out what that muscle is um, and then how to develop that and, and then how to how to actually then also have that challenge you so that you're finding a new path towards attention. And so and maybe it's, as Wilson was talking about, being everything is behind. Like, it's very important to be able to be attentive and to be able to connect to behind. And so anyway, there's something really beautiful that, that this day has brought forward, so. And, and I think that's something that, that all uh, exemplary theater artists share. I mean, we see it very specifically here today in the work of Robert Wilson, but you know, in my own career, and I'm sure you guys, I mean, we've worked with so many people, um, and I could 
think of so many, especially actors who are just at the top of their game, where every, everything is, everything is, um, is asked of them. They have endless resources of ideas and things to try. They're physically very committed. It's that heightened level that, that it, which is which not everyone is capable of doing that has made for the remarkable productions that we've lived in, whether they are downtown or uptown, but the, the, the level of artistry of actors, designers, directors, um, and the aesthetics differ is really what makes outstanding art. And it's extremely difficult to do. I mean, very, very difficult to do. And that's one of the things wh when, I, when I look around that I, that I miss is just the is just, I mean, you would come out of shows and just, you couldn't believe what you had seen on the stage. I mean, it was so incredible. And and the work that we was required to bring the play there, and then the work that the w that was required of the audience to bounce that ball back, that, you know, actually, I men mentioned Bernie Gersten, he coined a term, he said there are electrons and, the, you know, and neutrons, and then there's a theatron, and that's something that the actors create and they send it into the audience. And then the audience takes it and makes it bigger and sends it back to the uh, actors and then they get it and they make it even bigger. And he would always go to Curtain Down on Wednesday matinees just to see if the theatrons were bouncing around the audience. And when they were, then everything was okay. But that's very hard to do. And we're honoring a man here today who, who really knew how to do that. And, and, you, and it's always done in different ways. You don't, there's no one path. That's what's so interesting about the field, but it's heightened to a level of such intensity um, that it can hurt your body sometimes. <laughs> uh, this is a tangent, but could we hear about Zalame and the Civil Wars, please? <laughs> Maybe we could be in contact with one another. <laughs> I could talk to you about them. I don't know, I mean, um, they're both, I, I just, I replaced someone in Civil Wars. I just, I think that my role was played by a little girl who did, ran, read, Mar said Mary Todd Lincoln's kind of crazy, crazy speech. Um, oh, that, uh, so, so little time, so many memories, but I, I am happy to be in touch with you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we, we came to an end of the panel, really, truly, this was uh, quite, uh, quite an informative, meaningful, and a very, very important evening. And this is also what we do at the Siegel. We bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And of course, um, this is right in the center of it. Again, uh, N. Catani was the leading dramaturg uh, in the Americas, um, Lincoln Center for 30 years, I don't know, 25. It ran the directors left there. And Wright wrote a great book on dramaturgy. Oh, here it is, uh, The Art of Dramaturgy. A great you book. You didn't bring it, but you happened to bring it. Um, so, and what she talked about today also, she talks about others. And as we said this morning, Hans Dies Lehmann, he said, theater is like a house or a museum, but it has many rooms and there are many possibilities and many ways to get on a mountain. So really, thank you. And now we are going to an uh, online panel at Help On and Christine Raman, who we heard today, uh, will be here if it all works out. And, uh, and Cohn, who we heard, so us. we're gonna try that. But I really, uh, this was extraordinary, I think. Thank you.